When fasting is the anomaly, that is when it works the best. I have said that so many times. Fasting should be a shock to your system. When it becomes the consistent norm, we run into a problem. So I wanted to introduce alternate day fasting compared to intermittent fasting. Not saying that one is necessarily better than the other, but this is a very good strategy for people that have been doing intermittent fasting for a very long time and are starting to get a little bit stagnant with it. Maybe you're bored, maybe your results just aren't what they used to be, or maybe even worse, you're starting to gain weight again with it, which can absolutely happen. It happened to me. You need to throw a wrench in some things, or better yet, throw a cattle prod. So what I'm suggesting here is we look at some of the data from alternate day fasting. But first, before we get kind of at a micro level, let's look at it from a macro level and see why alternate day fasting works so well. Alternate day fasting is where you are eating as much as you want, essentially within reason, whatever you want one day, and then the next day either fasting entirely or go into very aggressive caloric restriction, like only 25% of your normal calorie intake, right? So if you normally consume, let's just make it very simple math, just very easy. If you normally were to consume 1000 calories, Okay, you might be able to, on an alternate day fasting eating day, consume 2,000 or 3,000 calories, right? Okay, but on a day that you are fasting, you would eat either zero calories or go down to 25% of your caloric intake. So that would be 250 calories in that case, but no one lives on 1,000 calories a day. Point is, it allows for this consistent shock from a stressor like fasting with recovery. Shock, recovery, shock, recovery. So what we end up facing with intermittent fasting most of the time is it becomes such a pattern. And again, think back, think about your strategy with intermittent fasting. Do you find that you probably end up fasting more often than you don't, right? Like if you were to look at a week, are you probably fasting four days out of the week? you probably are fasting more often than you are not, which means that fasting is sort of losing its shock factor. You're still getting the benefit of that you know, lowered caloric intake, right? That restricted intake is definitely gonna trigger some positive effect, but eventually your metabolism is gonna adjust to that. I'm always a fan of adding more calories in and then aggressively dropping them. More calories and aggressively dropping them. That way, massive recovery, but also massive catecholamine adrenaline response that liberates fat. So let's take a look at some research here. There is a study that was interesting, a meta-analysis that was published in the Frontiers in Nutrition, took a look at seven various studies with alternate day fasting. And it's pretty fascinating because it aggregated like 269 people. And these studies were over the course of one to three months. Okay, so on average, they found that people that alternate day fasted one to three months ended up losing on average over four kilograms. So, you know, we're talking like 15 pounds between one and three months, not even restricting calories, just by alternate day fasting. But the best part about all of this was metabolic markers improved. So without even trying to lose weight, people lost weight. They had tons of flexibility because they could eat whatever they wanted to on the non-fasting days, but then they had improvements in their LDL, improvements in HDL, improvements in triglycerides, fasting insulin, fasting glucose, glucose tolerance. They're all the metabolic drivers and metabolic markers improved. Probably because you're taking a break from eating and kind of giving yourself a potential break from insulin resistance, right? So very effective there. Now, what do you eat during alternate day fasting? And like, you know, when it's kind of an ad libitum alternate day fasting, which we can talk about in a second. I mean, the reality is as long as you are getting enough protein in, you have a lot of flexibility because the benefit is coming from the fasting period in this particular case. You should still look for nourishment and you should still eat good quality food. I, the, I put a link down below for Thrive Market. They're an online membership-based grocery store. So as far as food goes, that's what I typically use. Like I stock my pantry with stuff from Thrive, but they're a sponsor on this channel. So I put a link down below because they are a sponsor. You get 25% off your first order with Thrive, but you also get a free gift when you order through that link down below. So yes, that's the way YouTube works. It's awesome that I have sponsors to support this content and it's awesome that I have sponsors that are sponsors that I actually use. Okay, so that link is down below. Again, it gets delivered right to your doorstep so you can sort by keto, paleo, whatever kind of diet you're doing and you can sort by sugar-free, by gluten-free. It's amazing search interface and then it just pop right on your doorstep in a couple days. So anyway, that link is down below. So the whole point with ad libitum is that you can eat whatever you want. Like you really can. 
you're gonna allow yourself to not have the caloric restriction metabolic slowdown. When you look at the studies with alternate day fasting, you don't see a lot of metabolic slowdown. Now, the moment that you start restricting calories, you are going to have an adjustment in your metabolism accordingly, right? So if you look at some of the studies, you do start to see that yes, the mean caloric intake drops by like 152 calories, even on an eating day. Okay, so when you look at basically people that alternate day fast, they fast one day and they eat one day, even ad libitum, even eating however much they want, whatever they want, they still on average were eating about 152 calories less than they normally would. A lot of that has to do with stomach distensibility. The stomach is shrinking, so you just have less desire to eat. But another big piece is because you are fasting so long on your fasting days, you're actually giving yourself a chance to elevate ketone levels, and you're actually giving yourself a chance for PGC1A to activate, developing more mitochondria, mitochondrial density. You're also activating fat adaptation via PPAR alpha, which is always you know, rearing its head on this channel. That protein that travels into the nucleus, nuclear receptor protein, that changes the fundamentals of how our cells process fuel. That is going to make you just not be as hungry because your body can eat off of its fat stores more. So you naturally will start eating less, but be prepared that along with eating less comes a metabolic slowdown associated. But it's nice with alternate day fasting because then you have the aggressive sort of sprint of fasting that still kind of whittles away at the fat and uh, the fat on your body a little bit more. Now with intermittent fasting, there's not a problem with it, but what we face is people consistently intermittent fast and consistently restrict calories with no real phase of having this surge of calories. Let me ask you this again. With intermittent fasting, do you actually, on days you are not fasting, do you eat ad libitum or do you still control your calories? You probably still control your calories. It's common, right? If I were to fast three or four days per week, the three days that I'm not fasting, I'm certainly not going out and binging. Right? I'm still controlling it and I'm probably still counting, which means that I am putting myself in a deficit on my intermittent fasting days and then I'm probably putting myself to a deficit or maybe just at maintenance on my non-fasting days. Over time, you see how much of a net caloric decrease that is. With alternate day fasting, you're eliminating that because you're at least eating as much as you want and because the fast is so aggressive on the subsequent day, you feel okay with doing that. So psychosomatically, it's doing something for you where you feel like, I kind of ate a lot today, but it's okay because I have an aggressive fast tomorrow. Is that an eating disorder? Depends who you ask. I don't think so. I think it's very calculated and very structured and one of the most important things that you can do with that is keep it that way. Keep it structured. Don't let it become loose. Let it become a lifestyle, but keep it structured so you're not thinking about, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna eat that entire wedding cake. I don't care what Bob says, it's his wedding, but I want that cake. Just because you do that doesn't mean that you can just you know, fast the next day and it just absolves you of all the negativity and bad things you did the day before, right? Okay, you have to have responsibility with it. Alternate day fasting comes with a lot of responsibility because it's pretty aggressive. So which one is better for you? How do you determine? Am I someone that should intermittent fast or someone that should alternate day fast? If you are just getting started, try intermittent fasting. Intermittent fast every other day, skip breakfast, skip lunch, consolidate your eating period into the afternoon and early evening, and do that three to four days per week, every other day. That is a perfect strategy for you, but you inevitably, you invariably are going to reach a point where you plateau and you get stagnant. You get bored, the weight starts to creep back, and that is because you have reached this phase where it's just caloric restriction. You may or may not realize it, but it's probably happening. That is a perfect time for you to switch over to alternate day fasting. Now, I'll have plenty of other videos if this becomes more popular, but if I wanted to talk about exercise and things like that, I just need to know that it's popular. So if you want to hear more on alternate day fasting, go ahead and comment down below and leave me a note saying you want more ADF content. I'll see you tomorrow.